I am Theodora Scarato, Executive Director of Environmental Health Trust, and I'm here to talk about birds, bees, trees, wildlife, and wireless in New York, on Long Island, uh, and in cities across the country. There is this rollout of what are called small cells. They're called small cells, even though they're not so small, right? They're tall poles, they have antennas on top, and they're going up in residential areas, in neighborhoods where you certainly couldn't have a macro tower, which would look like this. These, these tall towers we typically think of as a cell tower, but really these are shorter cell towers. They emit a kind of non-ionizing radiation called radiofrequency radiation. We often think about, you know, the families, you know, there might be one outside of window uh, or children in their play space, but as you can see, there are all these trees. So what about the trees? What about the birds that will often nest, perch on the antennas? We've known certainly that electromagnetic fields have affected trees. Uh, we've gone on uh, the, the studies in Spain by a Dr. Alphonse Balmori in the, in, the last in the last few decades, where he's been looking at the effect on storks or on house sparrows, you know, these, these birds that enjoy sharing their, the urban environment with us and have been perfectly capable of doing that over centuries and eons are now showing great declines in the number of bird species. There's even studies on the migration of birds that show that birds have a naturally occurring, as all life does, amount of magnetite that allows them to sort of follow the ley lines of the earth, the geomagnetic field of the earth is how they migrate over great distances. And that these unnatural fields are in fact deflecting them off of their migratory patterns, their migratory routes, and in some cases drawing them right into the towers uh, where, which leads, in many cases, to bird strikes and bird deaths when they hit the guy wires of the very large telecommunications towers. Um, frogs, recent studies uh, done by Alphonse Balmori in Valladolid, Spain, where he put Faraday cages over one tank of tadpoles, or eggs, in this case frog eggs, within 140 meters of an antenna and then left the other tank with the frog eggs out fully exposed to electromagnetic fields. And as the eggs hatched, he watched the development of the tadpoles and the ones that were protected by the Faraday cage showed completely normal development. The ones that were out in the open exposed to electromagnetic fields showed poor form development. Some actually outright died and others just never really got up to the, the actual energy and speed that the other tadpoles Develop. Now, we know that the ambient levels, the environmental levels are increasing because of all of the, you know, it's not just cell phones, right? We have smart this, smart that, drones, uh, self-driving cars, all manner of new industries and technologies that are machine to machine connections, not just cell phone to cell tower connections. And that's elevating the levels that are in the environment. And that's been documented, and we have that on our website at ehtrust.org, the escalating levels. We have links to a science that is documenting that, much of which I'm going to talk about today. There's been research on this for many, many years, and I'm only going to talk about a few recent studies and some review papers that have been done. Back in 2013, uh, there was a review that looked at the ecological effects, and they found that radiofrequency radiation had a significant effect on birds, insects, and other vertebrates, other, other organisms, and plants in 70% of the studies that the researchers had looked at for this review. The development and reproduction of birds and insects were the most strongly affected endpoints. This indicates that the limits that we have are not uh, necessarily protective and they need to be updated to protect animals as well as humans. So this is the study uh, published in Science of the Total Environment entitled Radio Frequency Radiation Injures Trees Around Mobile Phone Base Stations. And it's a nine-year field study. They studied 
dozens of trees, and they found a high level of damage in the trees in the vicinity of the antenna. Here are the transmitters over here. It's a Norway maple tree, and they followed it over several years. And here is the same tree, picture taken in the same place, 213, 214, 215, and 216. And you can see the damage to the crown. Here's another image from um, the, the uh, observation guide. They have a section of a red oak tree in 213, and then later in uh, 2015 in the same month with less foliage, less, less leaves. So we submitted this to the FCC, um, and actually many people did. So there are several copies on the official FCC record. The FCC, the this is the agency in the US government that ensures that laws are followed related to the exposures from radio frequency radiation from cell towers, the FCC. And they decided in 2019 that they didn't need to change their rules, that the rules that they had put in place in 1996 could remain the same. We sued them. And in 2021, the United States Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit ruled that that decision to keep those limits was arbitrary and capricious, um, and that they had ignored substantial evidence on the record, uh, non-cancer health effects, long-term exposure, children's vulnerability. They ignored the testimony of people who'd been injured and health effects such as memory damage or damage to the reproductive system. But pertinent to this webinar, there was a complete failure to address the environmental effects, the impacts to birds, bees, and trees court then ordered the FCC to address all of these issues that it had ignored. Children, long-term exposure, impacts to the developing brain, and also the environmental effects. Now, this was in 2021, and there has been no response since then from the FCC. So we await them taking action on this. And in fact, we have been filing uh, many studies that I'm going to talk about today and really calling on them to do their job when it comes to protecting the environment and the public, of course. But this is a statement from the court ruling in 2021. The Federal Communications Commission also completely failed even to acknowledge, let alone respond to comments concerning the impact of radio frequency radiation on the environment. And something else that we submitted was documents by Albert Manville, he is the former lead, one of the lead wildlife biologists working on cell towers. It talked about impacts to bird breeding, nesting, roosting, and survival in the vicinity of electromagnetic fields and impacts to wood storks, house sparrows, rock doves, magpies, and colored doves and other species. He also called for the federal agencies that really should be addressing this, not just the FCC, but the EPA, Department of Commerce, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, and other government entities, calling on them to be accountable on this issue. And yet those were ignored. And I actually have a clip of a talk that he gave. Other, other impacts uh, for from birds and other wildlife. So from 1980 to the present time, we've witnessed at least a 70 fold increase in ambient RFR. And this of course is growing. This affects us and virtually all wildlife 24 seven, 365. There's been very little field research conducted on wildlife. However, many of the negative effects from EMF observed in lab research animals could be used as models and as predictors to wildlife in the wild. So uh, something to consider. The biological effects of EMF are seen broadly across all taxa, including at frequencies of vanishing low intensities. EMF exposures are growing exponentially found in virtually all habitats from urban to rural to wilderness. So we just can't seem to get away from it. By adding 5G to an already overcrowded bandwidth on top of thousands to tens of thousands more satellites and ground-based stations, we're impacting all wildlife on us in very troubling wise. Ways. Add to this virtually no environmental review by the Federal Communication Commission before the rollout of 5G and the FCC's radiation standards now over 25 years out of date 
still based on thermal heating. While we have much yet to learn, we already know a great deal about EMF, and we've referenced much of this in our paper, um, and we need to move on and address it. So what we're doing with this unfettered use of EMF to our wildlife and habitats, in my opinion, is unconscionable. Wildlife belong to us all. This is a public trust. At the very least, we have a moral obligation to protect our planet and its wildlife inhabitants. With the ongoing six major extinction epoch, primarily as a result of us, we're doing a really miserable job in addressing these issues. Things could change if enough pressure making our voices heard, for example, or people voting their consciences. We're focused on the communication industry, its corporate boards and the regulators that might make a difference. The communication industry really needs to be bird, bat, habitat friendly. And I would say we're clearly failing on that front as well. We need to make informed conservation decisions based on adequate environmental assessments and sound science. Briefly, from what I presented here, the evidence is overwhelming in favor of action. Clearly, there is a clarion call for a massive paradigm shift. Otherwise, the alternatives are grim for all parties concerned. Instead of having them look like cell towers, they're dressing them up like trees. This is a not a tree, it is a fake tree. And here's some more. They're actually called monopines. This is a protest that happened uh, in France to block an antenna that was being put up because they were going to chop down dozens of trees in order to put up the antenna system. Trees are being cut down in order to make the road and also the, where the equipment goes as well as where the antenna is. And here's just another picture where the residents were trying to stop the facility from being built and the federal judge denied their request. So here's some other examples of what antennas look like. And the more antennas you have, when you're close to the antenna, the higher the exposures, the closer you are to an antenna. The proliferation of antennas is increasing the exposure in the environment. This is from New Orleans. So you can see the different ways that they look. Some are these straight lights where they pop them on, or in this case, it is a new pole that's been put up, or here's one of these electric poles with antennas on the top. These ones are from Illinois where they have a streamlining law. Unlike New York, uh, in about over half the states have laws that really strip local authority. So the cities and towns and villages don't have as much authority related to where these goes. And companies can apply and their applications are can move forward quite fast because there's a time limit. There's also caps on fees in many communities. They're called streamlining bills. So these are from uh, Illinois. And here's one in front of a community in New York City. These are the jumbo 5G poles that are going up. And people are really upset about it for a lot of reasons. Um, they are gigantic. They're 32 feet high. They have one, two, three, four, five tiers. Each of these tiers will be rented out for different uh, networks. So there are levels for each antenna, the antennas. And then a lot of the equipment actually goes in the pole. So the pole um, has the electrical and a lot of the equipment. Here's some other pictures of the jumbo poles. 14 community boards in New York City have written letters. Uh, they're calling for a moratorium or a disapproval of the poles, or they have a uh, off stated that they don't like where they are. The community opposition to, has been pretty massive, actually. And you can go onto our website at ehtrust.org to learn more about that. We have links to all of the, everything going on in New York City. You can just tie, um, type in New York City in the search bar. But what just happened was um, Congressman Nadler wrote the FCC and requested that there be an evaluation on the issue of historical review. Just on April the 20th, the FCC wrote to City Bridge, who's putting up all of these antennas, stating that they had to look at the, um, they had it would had to be compliant uh, with 
the laws related to historical review and environmental review. And so all of that is happening right now. And the reason I'm bringing it up is that a lot of these antennas are going up so fast and all the, the laws and the checks that we might think might be in place are not necessarily happening because there isn't oversight. There's not, the FCC is not checking to make sure that networks are being deployed as the application states. Communities aren't even taking the time, but not because they they just don't have an infrastructure in place to be tracking everything, checking, making sure that all the laws are followed and that the reviews that need to be done have been completed. In fact, the FCC doesn't have a registry where we have all of the polls that are going up in the country. Many other countries do, but not the FCC. They have mostly macro sites, but not the small cells and not certainly not the um, rooftop antennas, which is another issue. This is a study that looked at 1,200 studies. It was a review on impacts to flora and fauna from non-ionizing electromagnetic radiation. And what they found, this was published in 2022 by Blake Levitt, who's a science writer, Albert Manville, who used retired from the US Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as Dr. Henry Lai, a professor who has worked on this for many, many years. And they found impacts across all species and at vanishingly low frequencies, uh, very much compared to today's ambient exposures, those exposures that are in the air. They talk about first documenting the increased exposure to animals and to the airspace where airborne species live, as well as trees, the natural environment. And then they talk about the studies and they have tables with the different levels that the effects were found. And then their final papers, the final, the third part of the review is on the need for federal regulatory action to protect wildlife and to protect habitat where wildlife lives. This is a quote from the paper, broad wildlife effects have been seen on orientation and migration, food finding, reproduction, mating, nest and den building, territorial maintenance, defense, and longevity and survivorship. And of course, genotoxic effects have been observed. Type in birds on cell towers, and there are so many pictures. This is where they build their nests. This image was actually used in an industry talk uh, by Orange, which is a telecommunications provider in Europe. And this is the image that uh, the uh, engineer, the radio frequency engineer concluded his talk with. There is a, a growing and quite substantial body of research on impacts to insects and to bees. They have found reduced motor activity, biochemical changes indicating stress, uh, the induction of the worker piping signal and a decline in colony strength and a change in queen egg laying rate. Now I'm going to share with you from one of the scientists who did the study on the worker piping signal and he describes how he did his research. Uh, the worker piping generally, it announces the swarming process of the bee colony or it is a signal of a disturbed bee colony. I have a clip from a documentary called Something is in the Air. It's a documentary by Flipped Media. And this is a clip from uh, Daniel Favre talking about the bee study he did. The smoke today, nowadays, is helping the beekeeper to calm the bees. Oh, there are a lot here. In order to perform this experiment, I have to record the noise that the hive is producing. And for this, I have to install a microphone in this so-called nourishing hole. Okay. The idea is to have a small discussion or music in this radio apparatus, so that this cellular phone uh, is continuously emitting as if somebody would speak through this phone. 
the ID is to check whether or not the electromagnetic fields emitted by cellular phones would have uh, an impact on the behavior of the honeybees in the hive. So the ID is just to start the phone call, start the recording, and just wait. And in two, three, four, five hours, to stop the communication, to go to the computer with the sound file and to analyze what was going on in the hive. My conclusion is that electrosmog is disturbing definitely the behavior of uh, honeybees. Not only the, the honeybees are affected. Uh, we know honeybees because they are in the hive, we can observe them. But in nature you have 200 or 300 wild bees, which are also affected with bumblebees, which also help pollination. And uh, the forthcoming 5G will also affect their behavior. So uh, at, at the end, you will have a, a, maybe a collapse of all insects, especially the pollinating insects. And without pollination, you have no fruits, you have no vegetables, and then big trouble. Uh, forthcoming 5G will uh, go up to 60 gigahertz. Now we have 3.8. And according to scientific literature, problems will arrive as soon as we go above a certain value, 6 gigahertz. And in this scientific article, it was shown that insects will suffer in their physiology, behavior, and other problems due to this 5G. What scientists are saying is that we know enough to know. We know enough to know that this is having a major impact. So what I have in this picture is a study that he was speaking to has to do with 5G frequencies, those higher frequencies that we're using now. The companies are going up to higher frequencies in order to move things faster, faster downloads. In this study, this was not about effects to the bees specifically. It really was about the exposure because when you study animals or people, you need to do a couple things, right? You want to see what effects do we have in the, the living being being exposed, but also what is the actual exposure that they're receiving? How deeply is the radio frequency radiation energy being absorbed into the body or the tissue? So this study was looking at the honeybee and looked at the same power. So if it, the power was the same, but you changed the frequency, what would the exposure be like? And they found that as this is two gigahertz, 24 gigahertz, 120 gigahertz, but as the frequency got higher, close to the size of the insect, the exposure became higher, even though the power was the same. In other words, as the frequency changes, the absorption into the honeybee can drastically change. And they found that it was quite a high percentage. The light colors are the highest absorption and then the darker colors are less. So here you can see in 24 gigahertz how there's more red. So the colors go from yellow, orange, red, purple, blue. There's this point where the absorption goes through the whole body in a way that's very different from any other frequencies. There's that point of resonance and then the absorption becomes much, much higher. And the scientists in this study 
caution that this could lead to changes in insect behavior, physiology, and morphology over time due to actually an increase in body temperature from dielectric heating. This is very important because with 5G, with 6G, with 7G, we're using higher and higher frequencies that have not been tested, have not been safety tested, certainly not safety tested for animals or insects. They went on, the same researchers, to look at the bee in different parts of their life cycle. And this is just a, a image from the second study that they did as a follow-up. And here they didn't use the colors, so they just used a gray scale. But as the frequency changes, the absorption into the animal changes. This is Alfonso Balmori, who's a wildlife biologist and published so much research. I'm so thankful for the work he's done. But this study that he published in 2021 talks about how non-ionizing electromagnetic radiation is an emerging driver factor for the decline of insects. There's even research on fish. So zebrafish, on the one hand, we study zebrafish to understand what the impacts might be to humans. But at the same time, we can understand that it also can be a study that looks at what are the impacts to fish, right? This was an important study because the Oregon State University, they used actually the zebrafish as a model for humans, and they exposed the fish to 3.5 gigahertz and found long-term effects later. First, they did a short-term exposure, and then they did a longer-term exposure, and they found impacts to the development of the zebrafish. There's research on impacts to plants. And this was a study uh, done by Malka Haugamug on peer-reviewed studies that found the majority of them showed physiological or morphological effects, 89.9%. And they also found that there were certain frequencies that different plants were more responsive to and that certain um, plants that they had studied were more sensitive and they were maize, uh, roselle, uh, pea, fenugreek, Greek, duckweeds, tomato, onions, and mung bean plants. There's actually a study that was just published on lettuce, which is really interesting, showing effects from radio frequency to lettuce growth. So you think about crops and crops under cell towers and farms. Now in India, several years ago, several ministries got together and decided to look at what are the impacts to birds, bees, and trees. And so they found the majority of studies showed impacts to birds, bees, and trees, as well as humans. And they dropped their limits from what they were all the way down to a 10th of the limit that they had. They had an ICNRP limit. They went to a 10th of that. Many countries actually are similar to the FCC and Japan and Australia, allowing quite a lenient amount of radio frequency in the air. There are many countries that have more restrictive limits, like India, uh, China, Russia, Switzerland, while it allows as much as the US in some areas when it comes to homes and schools and places where people spend many hours a day, they have a more restrictive limit. There's a lot about that on our website at ehtrust.org if you're interested. Juhi Chawla, who was a former Miss India, she became involved in this issue and was raising awareness across the country. She received the Indira Gandhi Memorial Award several years ago, and I'm going to play a little clip from her talk and also from some news clips about how she got involved in it. We wouldn't want that 20 years down the line we have an, an entire population of young children, young adults, old, suffering from various health effects due to our negligence, our inaction, or our ignorance. Radiation from cell towers, which have been mushrooming up in our city, on top of residential buildings, near schools, on top of hospitals. The cause that I have been involved with and I would like to spread awareness about is the harm that this can do to our health. 14 mobile cell towers came up almost overnight. We wrote to the chief minister once, twice. Uh, they did reply 
but they told us to um, address our concern to Mantrale. We put up banners outside our building uh, requesting the chief minister to take notice. The press all came, they all wanted to know what it was about and literally within two weeks all the towers went. This is happening not just in Mumbai in front of my house, it's happening opposite everybody's, practically everybody's house. It is going to affect everybody, the men and the women, the children and the old, the rich and the poor. The people in the city and the people in the villages. And not just all of us. This radiation, which was not there 15, 20 years ago, is going to also affect our environment, our birds, our bees, our flowers, our, our farming. She has been doing so much work, not only on impacts to birds, bees, and trees, but also on plastics and other environmental toxins. So what's happening in the United States? We have a catch up to do here. Because we have not addressed this issue at the federal level, states have taken this on in different ways. In Maine, there is a proposed law to be looking at impacts to wildlife. I would just like to present LD 697, which tasks the University of Maine with investigating the effects of so-called 5G technology on bird, bee, and insect populations and long-term effects on children. In New Hampshire, they created a commission on 5G health and environmental effects. The commission studied the issue for over a year. They issued a final report with 15 recommendations, which are really excellent to address the regulatory gap at the federal level, as well as what the state can do. Two of them were engage agencies, this is at the federal level, with ecological knowledge to develop radio frequency safety limits that will protect the trees, plants, insects, and pollinators, birds. And they asked that under the National Environmental Policy Act, the FCC do an environmental impact statement on the effect um, on New Hampshire and the country as a whole from 5G and the expansion of radio frequency wireless technologies. The commission, by the way, had representatives from the Senate from the Congress, the representatives, as well as from all of the agencies of New Hampshire, the departments, the you know, attorney general's office and so forth, and a medical doctor, an EMF scientist, and it was a bipartisan report. If you're interested in this issue, there is a paper published by former FCC attorney Erica Rosenberg called Environmental Procedures at the FCC, a Case Study in Corporate Capture. And I interviewed her, that video is online on our YouTube channel right now. But what she talks about is how the FCC has just failed to follow the environmental laws that we have, NEPA. Tell you what she points out. The fact that there's no registry, there's no oversight, no accountability. Everything is excluded from needing to be reviewed. There's a categorical exclusion. So she goes into all the ways that the environment has not been properly attended to amidst the rush to deploy 5G and new wireless technologies, because it's not just about 5G. She says towards the end of her paper in the conclusion, the result of the FCC's lack of accountability is cumulative and incalculable environmental damage, views of protected landscapes and historic sites ruined, wetlands filled, endangered species habitat cleared, sacred sites desecrated, burial mounds and archeological sites disturbed and fragile underwater environments degraded. So a couple other issues about putting up uh, facilities and towers in neighborhoods. There's pruning and the chopping down of trees as I discussed, who's monitoring the pruning? Where is the oversight on that? And what happens if trees are impacted? So here you have a small cell, it goes up in front of a house. You have these trees that are right here. Um, likely some of these trees, if they're really close, will be pruned. And who's doing that? How aggressive is the pruning? If you prune too much, the tree then begins to die. Trees are critical to climate protection. They reduce AC and energy use. They uh, capture carbon. They reduce temperature in communities. 
and capture air pollution, help prevent flooding, keep the soil nutrient rich. So we can't afford to harm our trees, our street trees, our forests, our woods, unless you have a local community that has an ordinance or is attending to this issue, trees are often not respected. Washington DC has put in protections related to this. No small cell poles within 15 feet of trees. No street tree should be removed or have its protected root zone impacted to accommodate the installation of small cell infrastructure. And no tree shall be pruned related to the installation or functioning of the small cells. So I would urge everyone on the call to check what protections you have in your community to protect your trees and hopefully to have them be as strong as possible. There's a great article if you're interested summarizing a lot of what I talked about in the Society of Environmental Journalists journal called Is Wireless Technology an Environmental Health Risk? There's also What Will 5G Mean for the Environment? Uh, that was published in the University of Washington magazine. In this article, she brings up one more important thing I wanted to talk about, which is energy usage, impact climate. All of these new devices, all of these new antenna systems are increasing energy use. Now, it's true that every year they are making devices so much more efficient but that doesn't address that there is just so many more of them. The energy efficiency gains are outswamped by, by the sheer amount of devices. 